Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to Late Night Leos. This is your host, Morgan Beebe. Tonight, I have Lauren O'Brien from the Gecko Sanctuary. Lauren, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm really looking forward to this episode. Uh, why don't we start with your history, how you got into animals, and did you start out by breeding, or was it rescuing from the beginning? Yeah, sure. So um, it was rescuing from the beginning. Um, I've actually been involved in, you know, kind of general animal rescuing for about, oh, goodness. I'm trying to subtract my age now from the age then. Uh, so probably about 14, 15 years, um, you know, started out uh, volunteering at a, a cat shelter, um, I, I used to foster for a, a rat rescue um you know, volunteered at several dog and cat shelters. And uh, when I started getting into reptiles as pets, uh, it was pretty evident pretty quickly that there were next to no, you know, rescue resources for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I kind of decided, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to help out a little bit. Um, so it started out just kind of individually rescuing, you know, just taking an animal here or there, getting vet care yeah. for it, um, and then through, I'm not even quite sure, ended up with a, you know, 501c3 registered rescue in the state of Massachusetts. Wow. Yeah, and that's, that, is that like a, did they look at you funny or <laughs> when you're wanting a, a rescue, you know, a business license for something like that, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, when I go to the bank and I have to, like, you know, deposit funds, you know, that we get through donations, you know, a lot of times yeah. we do the, uh, the gecko sanctuary, and I'm like, oh, you know, you know, we're a rescue, you know, we rescue reptiles, and they're like, how does that work? I'm like, pretty much the exact same way cat and dog rescues work, just reptiles instead of cats and dogs. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's like another thing I bet you battle with is the whole, like, disposable pet stigma that comes along with reptiles, you know, just send it down the toilet, don't even worry about it if it gets sick. Is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we get a lot of, you know, when I tell people, you know, what our organization is, we get a lot of, oh, do they really need rescuing? And yeah, like, right? Yep. Yes, they, yeah, yeah, actually, it's like quite, you know, we're, you know, generally overwhelmed with the requests from people who want to surrender their animals to us. So, yep, can say pretty assuredly they, they do require rescuing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. so our uh, listeners know, we are taking calls. If you want to ask Lauren a question, you know, maybe like we could do some basic health issues. If you happen to have an animal right now, our number is one six four six seven one six five four zero three, and we also have a chat room on Blog Talk Radio right now. So I just want to plug that in so that we get get some people that might need some help, you know, because. Like yep. we were talking about, it's not popular at all for the reptile rescues. And a lot of times, you know, I don't – do you have any kind of medical training? No, like no, that? pretty much all of – no, pretty much all of my medical training comes from, you know, just having done this rescue work for, you know, coming up on four years now. So, um, yep. yeah, I, I, you know, I so you, no classes, no courses, anything like that. Um, but, so you know, I, like I, just, I, oops, sorry, go ahead. Like self, self-taught, you know? Yeah, and I mean, um, I'm, I'm very lucky uh, where I am. There's several amazing um, exotic vets around here. So, you know, I, I essentially really don't do anything with the animals without, you know, at least checking in with one of those vets, um, you know. I mean, if it's a minor thing, you know, if there's duck shed, you know, leopard gecko comes in with duck shed nuts toes, then obviously, you know, I'm going to work that off. But, you know, yeah. any any major medical issue or anything that, you know, I mean, they all get vet checked when they come in. But, um, you know, I, I've, I've learned a lot just by, you know, getting to know um, the vets that we work with. And, um, I mean, they're great. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of if you have exotic pets like try to find a vet near you that has experience with them yeah yeah that's and that's a big problem for a lot of people especially 
like in the Midwest, I hear that, you know, it's all dog and cat. Right, right. Um, you know, the only thing with that is, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there are exotic vets that will conference with, you know, what you call a normal vet, a cat and dog vet. So yeah. your, cat or, your cat or dog vet might not know exactly what's going on, but there might be an exotic vet that they can kind of like call and conference with and, you know, get treatment. So that's something yeah. to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah. So we do have a caller if you want to take a caller real quick. Yeah, sure. All right. Caller from the 530, you're on the air. Well, hello, late night, Le- late night Leos again. This is Jeff. How's it going, Jeff? Good. I finally got the number. I forgot it. It's been so long. <laughs> so, Jeff, do you have any uh, medical questions for Lauren? Um, no, not really. I just called in to listen, but it's good to hear the show back on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Lauren, uh, what does it take to get the 501c3? Is that a long process? Yes. Uh, Well, yes and no. So um, the 501c3, for those who don't know, is the federal designation um, of a nonprofit organization, so a tax-exempt nonprofit organization. Um, So to get your 501c, you have to be incorporated. Um, That varies by state. So um, I can speak to, you know, kind of how Massachusetts works, but um, if someone wants to set up a 501c3, um, in their own state that it's not Massachusetts, um, they'd have to kind of do research into how that works because um, everything's a little bit different. But in Massachusetts, you have to get incorporated. Um, you have to have at least three board members. So um, oh, wow. you can't, yeah, you can't run a nonprofit by yourself. Um, the idea is that it's a kind of checks and balances system. Yeah. Um, so you need to have at least three of you, three board members, um, and at least one of them cannot be related to you. You can't recruit, like, your parents and call it a day. Oh, they won't okay. accept that. <laughs> um, and then there's a form. You can literally, you know, go on federal website and download it. I think it's been I think, three years since I filed it, but it's like a 10- to 12-page form. Most of it's pretty explanatory. Since you've already done the incorporation, a lot of it is similar to that. Um, you have to state kind of your purpose, like, how, you know, what would qualify you to be a nonprofit. Um, obviously, in my case, it's, you know, rescuing reptiles and amphibians. Um, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of numbers, which I actually hired um, an accountant to help me with because math is not my strong point. <laughs> you have to kind of, like, project – like I think it's three years in the future, no, five or ten years in the future, you have to, like, project how much money you think you'll be raising. Oh, wow. And then base, yeah, which is not, I went to an accountant, and I was like, please save me. <laughs> um, and then from those figures determines, like, the fee that you have to pay. So um, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but let's say it's, like, $10,000 a year. So if it's your $10,000 a year or less, in what you think you would raise as a nonprofit, you pay a $400 fee to file your 501c3. If it's above that, you pay $800 to file for your 501c3. Wow. So, yeah. so on top of, like, spending all your free time to care for other people's animals, you also have to pay fees to be able to care for other people's animals? Yep, yep. And I, and I'll, I mean, I will say with the 501c3, once you've paid – the fees and that's it. Like until I deem I'm not a you know, until I fold the corporation um, essentially, you know. But in Massachusetts to run a rescue, I have to file with the attorney general every year, which does cost money. How much does that cost? Um the initial filing fee with the attorney general and that's for and again, every state a little little bit different. Some states don't require you do this. Some, you know, require it yearly. Um, so for the initial filing with the attorney general, which is essentially you do so that from the state you're allowed to solicit donations. So they don't just accept that you have a 501c3. They also want you to, like, register with them 
individually as a state to be able to solicit in their state for funds. Yeah. So I think initially it was like a $200 fee to like kick off the relationship with the attorney general. And now it's a, and again, it's bracketed by how much money you raise every year. We usually fall in like the $35 range every year. Okay. So it's not terrible. Well, I, I, yeah, but you do you do have to pay, you, but you do have to pay to be a nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, but once you get donations, I mean that covers it with your taxes, right? Yep, yep, and we are tax exempt, so um, you know I have to file our taxes every year, and you know file with the attorney generals every year, and um, but we're tax exempt, so we don't, you know, I don't have to give the government any additional money. Okay. Do you do things at the end of the year where where you like, you know how people scale up their taxes when it's getting close to the end and then, you know, donate extra or do some kind of thing to zero out? Yeah, I mean, I'm not overly concerned with zeroing out because we're a nonprofit. Um Okay. We you know, we generally if we quote unquote make a profit in a year, you know, that money's gone within the first few weeks of, you know, January. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not overly, I mean, we do, you know, obviously we do push for donations at that time because people, you know, sometimes do want to be able to go on their taxes and say that they donated that and use it as a credit. Um, yeah. There's actually, and of course, for, you know, like there's Black Friday. Your, Oops, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You would want to keep your business, the head up above water too. Right. Yeah, I mean, we want to have, you know, I don't want to go into the end of the year with zero dollars or negative funds. You know, we always yeah, try yeah. to have a little bit extra in the account because I never know what's coming through the door tomorrow. Yeah. You know, we've had emergency surgery. You know, we just had a, actually a leopard gecko that needed, you know, she came into the rescue and, like, the next morning, like, I took the day off from work to make it happen. Like the next morning, I dropped her off at the vet at 7 a.m. to have emergency surgery. Wow. So, but she made it. She, she's actually being adopted soon. So, that's actually well, that's you know, good. a good story. But, you know, those, those things happen. So, we always try to make sure that we have a positive in the account for, for things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And how would somebody get a hold of you to give donations? Um, yep, so um, we have a PayPal, so um, they can PayPal, geckosanctuary at gmail.com. Um, if they find us on Facebook, we're just facebook.com slash the gecko sanctuary. Um, we have like a little donate button like right on the top of our Facebook page. Okay. So and they can click that, that and, it'll, and it'll take them to like a PayPal page and they can, you know, Okay. Go from there. The, the PayPal is is just Gecko Sanctuary or the Gecko Sanctuary at Yahoo. Yep, yep. Uh, it's Gecko Sanctuary at Gmail dot com for the PayPal. At Gmail. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. And again, if they go to our Facebook, the little donate button is like right there if they just want to do that. Right on. Yeah, it's it's good to get funds so that you know the smaller creatures in the world can get some help. Right. I mean, it's, you know, I'm very lucky. The organization's really lucky. We have some really um, amazing people, like, you know, really dedicated followers who whenever we have a fundraiser help out and, you know, donate a lot. But um, as I'm sure everyone in this hobby is aware, you know, the general population doesn't get the warm feelings about reptiles the way that we do. So um, yeah. it can definitely be tough to fundraise sometimes because it just doesn't generate the same emotion as, like, cats and dogs do with a wider audience. Yeah, yeah, and I, I even see that sometimes with people that keep reptiles is if their animal gets sick, you know, they're not going to take it to the vet or do any kind of care with, with the animal. Do you see that ever? Yes, that is um, so our, our number one, I would say, cause for surrender is the child got bored with it. Um, a very close yeah. second is the animal is sick and I don't want to slash can't bring it to the vet. Um, wow. And, and, and usually the problem there is, you know, 
they wait until the animal's really sick to throw yeah. under it. And to me, you know, if you don't want to bring it to the vet or you can't bring it to the vet, I, I really do try to be as non judgmental as possible. You know, let us know when the animal first starts getting sick. Yeah, definitely. Because reptiles are really hard to rehabilitate. And, if they, you know, once they kind of go over that threshold, it can be really difficult, even with, you know, the amazing vets that we work with, to bring these animals back. Yeah, yeah. It's, I I can imagine that you're, you know, having the job that you have doing the gecko sanctuary, it must really strain on your relationship with people that breed them on a on a larger scale. Does that influence your friendships with bigger breeders at all? Um, I guess, I'm, funny enough, I don't really know many bigger breeders. Um, I know some. Um, I wouldn't say that we're, like, best friends. Um, I think there's definitely some people that walk by my table at the expo and maybe aren't happy that I'm there, um, and that's okay. Um, you know, most of my connections in the reptile world are, you know, the smaller breeders, the hobby breeders. Um, yeah. Not generally the people that are kind of breeding on a mass scale. Okay. So since we're on the topic of breeding, is there any, any kind of advice for people that are, you know, maybe we could talk about responsible breeding, uh, setting up some kind of savings account for medical care when it happens so that way you're not stuck with the animals or similar businesses aren't stuck? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, again, like I said, most of my connections are the smaller breeders and, um, you know, a lot of them, you know, we'll ask questions when people want to buy an animal. It's not just, oh, great, you're willing to pay the fee, here's the animal. Um, you yeah. know, a lot of them will take the time to ask the person about their setup, you know, make sure that they have the right enclosure and the right supplies for the animal that they want to bring in. Um, you know, make themselves available for questions. Even if someone, um, you know, has all the right enclosure, maybe they've never had a reptile before, maybe this is their first reptile, you know, be available for questions. Um, yeah. You know, if, you know, like, I'm, you know, you know, you're well aware, you know, <laughs> leopard geckos will sometimes, like, not really eat much during breeding season, you know? Like, we've had people yeah. that have wanted to surrender because they're like, my leopard gecko is not eating. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, can you give me some background on what, how the enclosure is set up? You know, what's going on? Can you send me a picture? And they sent me a picture of this, like, gorgeous, like, probably a little too fat leopard gecko. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, you don't need to surrender him. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's breeding season. And, like, as long as he's not really losing weight, just keep offering food, and he will eventually start eating again. You know? Um, yeah. It's... Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. Um <laughs> Yeah, and then, um, you know, it's tough. I, you know, I've had a lot of my friends who are breeders that, you know, kind of come to me and are like, you know, I can't guarantee that everyone's going to take the best care of these animals, you know, and that's yeah. difficult for them. You know, these are people that, you know, put their sweat, blood, tears, you know, into breeding. And, oh, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, a lot of times they're like, what can I, you know, even if I ask to see the enclosure and ask a bunch of questions, like you never know, you know, yeah. and that's true. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's really no, you know, there's certain things you can do to try to, you know, be responsible, you know, more responsible in selling and, you know, supporting the people that you've sold to. But, you know, there's no perfect science to it. I mean, I'm, even with us, we do an adoption application, references, you know, they have to send a picture yeah. of the enclosure. You know, that's still yeah. technically no guarantee, you know? Like, there's yeah. sadly no perfect science to it. Yeah, I've, I've dealt with that myself coming up on 14 years now of, you know, leopard geckos. And you can have this guy that just spent $5,000 on his room, and he wants to spend 2000 on geckos. And then a year later, I ask him where they're at, and, oh, a couple died, I didn't feed them, and I don't know where anything else is, and, 
you know, they just, it's like a, a revolving hobby, I guess is what you could call it. For yeah, right. I, yeah, and, you know, I've, I've had some people that have said, you know, well, you know, I sold this animal for this much money, um, you know, they're going to take care of it. And while I do definitely think, generally speaking, if it's a, you know, higher priced animal, there's a better chance yeah. that the person will take oh, care yeah. of it. But we have had some quote unquote expensive animals like surrendered to our rescue. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's not, you know, I will freely admit that the mass, you know, vast majority are, you know, $15 Petco leopard geckos that got surrendered to us. But, you know, we've had, you know, quote unquote fancy morphs of bearded dragons, um, you know, things like, you know, we have a Dumeril boa right now. Oh, wow. Know, yeah, she's beautiful. She's she's fun. She's a, she's an interesting snake. Um, you know, but people sell those for, you know, 150 to 250 dollars, and we still got one in yeah. the rescue. You know, so um, just just yeah, no perfect science to it. Science to it. I wish there was. Yeah. Do you think that overpopulation and overbreeding is a an issue? I do, I do, and, you know, I really, I'm not anti-breeding. I, I, I get that question a lot where people are like, oh, do you support breeding? And I'm like, I do, like responsible breeding, I do, because I would rather there be, you know, healthy captive-bred animals, you know, yeah. versus wild-caught animals. Um, yeah, definitely. But I also see a lot of people who are breeding for all the wrong reasons, people that think they're going to, you know, put two bearded dragons together and hatch out 50 babies and make a ton of money. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, we, it can take a long time for us to adopt out animals like bearded dragons and leopard geckos. And not because the ones that we have, you know, aren't healthy or, again, some of them are, um, you know, we have a leopard gecko right now available for adoption um, who came from a, a breeder who, you know, fell on some hard times and, you know, really had to pretty much slim down their entire collection. So we took some of their animals. He's beautiful. I mean, he's gorgeous. He would probably, I don't know, probably sell for a few hundred dollars. And we can't, like, he's been up for adoption for three to four weeks now and, like, zero inquiries on him. Wow. Yeah, I've, you I've know, noticed so it's there definitely is. There's definitely certain species where it's, you know, and then you see these people that yeah. are like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to, like, I'm going to just go breed my leopard geckos. I'm just going to breed my bearded dragons. And it's like, you know, no. If you're breeding to, you know, make a healthier animal or, you know, you're doing it for the love yeah. of breeding, you're doing it for the love of the animal, then, like, I'm all for it. When it's, I'm going to make a ton of money selling these babies, which... You're not if you take care of the babies properly. Like you'll be very lucky if you break even. Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of people, especially the new ones that are interested in making money, they don't understand that. I mean, you're probably gonna if you just all butt and do it eight hours a day all week, you'd maybe make five dollars an hour. Right, <laughs> especially not... you know, especially with animals like bearded dragons who, you know, yeah. need UVB lights and go through like insane amounts of insects as babies. You know, I've had people that after they hatch them are like, oh, they eat so much. I'm like, yes, they do. Like, Yeah. So that's what you get for hatching 50 bearded dragon eggs. Like, you're going to have 50 hungry little mouths that need to be fed two to three times a day for a year. Yeah, you know? yeah and those little mouths get bigger. <laughs> yes, they do. Very quickly, which is, you know, we've we've had a few of those too, a few of you know, oh, this animal got bigger than we thought it was going to get. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, though that's another thing when it comes to responsible breeding. Like, especially if you're doing expos, like, have care sheets. Especially if you only yeah. work with a few species. Even if it's just, like, a little one-pager. Like, have care sheets. Yeah. You know, don't yeah. don't be afraid to tell people, like, this is how I take care of my animals, you know, here's some of the things I recommend, you know, which is especially helpful to, you know, a lot of new keepers. I mean, I remember my, my first reptile was a bearded dragon and 
you know, I mean, I did a ton of research, but, you know, it can be, you know, now that I've done reptiles for so long, it all seems so simple. But I remember the first time trying to figure out, like, how do I get, like, mount this UVB in the tank and, like, where yeah. do I put the basking spot and where do I put the, you know, like, trying to have that information yeah, it, in, like, an easily digestible form for people is, like, a, a great thing. Yeah, and, and stapling the business card to the care sheet always helps. Yes. Because I don't know how many times I get these emails and they got a gecko at a show, but they don't remember the breeder's name. We've we've had a few of those, too. I mean, we're happy to answer questions when we can. We, But, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, well, you know, because I'm like, oh, he's not eating. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, did yeah. you talk to the breeder? You know, maybe, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, we, we had a corn snake that would only eat brown mice. And yeah, it took us a long exactly. time to figure that out. But, like, we yeah. finally figured it out that, like, for whatever reason, the only colored mice that he would eat were brown mice. Yeah, like, that's, some, that's like some a of these guys have like that. Yeah, find out what they were eating before you get it. Right. Yeah, you know, and you know, reptiles are are generally not the biggest fans of changes. So, um, yeah, you know, if you can tell your customers like, hey, this is what I've been feeding them, you know. If you want to transition them over to something else, you know, that's probably okay, but probably good to have this on hand for a while while you're trying to make that transition. Yeah. You know, if you have a leopard gecko that's used to eating dubia roaches and all you offer is mealworms, like, you might run into some issues. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough. We do have just about... Two and a half minutes left. Uh, is there anything else that you want to really get out there and cover? Um, I think, you know, if, and I mean, I can't speak for all rescues, but I, you know, I've, I've networked with pretty much all the other rescues that are in, you know, New England. Um, you know, and pretty much just, just support us. We're not, again, all the rescues that I've, coordinated with, like, we're not anti-breeder, we're not anti, you know, people keeping reptiles or anything like that, um, you know, so don't be afraid to, to talk to us and ask us questions and, you know, help us out when you can, you know. Yeah. Again, I'm all for responsible breeders, um, but any breeders are still, to some degree, contributing to the problem. Yeah. So if, you can, so if you can help, help you know, the few of us that are, you know, trying to work the other end, it, it really is very appreciated. And, I mean, we've gotten some awesome support, so I don't want to make it sound like we don't, we haven't because um, we really have. Um, but, yeah, I mean, really, any support, if you, you know, if you can't donate, totally understand that. But, you know, share rescue posts, um, you know. Yeah. Someone's looking for an animal and you, you know, don't, that's not the animal that you breed, but you know a rescue has one, you know, refer the person to the rescue. If you have, you know, extra supplies, check in with your rescue, see if it's something that they can use, and you can take that as, you know, even donating supplies, you can take as a tax deduction. It doesn't have to be, yeah. you know, just physical, you know, cash or PayPal. Um, yeah. You know, because again, I mean, most... Pretty much all the rescues I know, especially that do reptiles, you know, it's a it's a labor of love. You know, I work a full time job in addition to doing this. Yeah. You know, we don't we don't get funds from the federal government or the state. You know, all of our funds come from you know fundraising or or generally our own pockets. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you res rescues are able to do. You know, just. It's so great. And I want to thank you, Lauren, for coming on. And everybody, go check out the Gecko Sanctuary on Facebook. And just send a little something. I mean, if you can't send anything, like Lauren was saying, just donate something and share posts. I mean, that's the least anybody can do. Share the page. So, right. thank well, you, I mean, Lauren, word of for coming is, on. It's huge. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you so much, and I will talk to you later. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. All right, bye. Oh, so Jeff, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. That, that was interesting. Yeah, huh? yeah, you know, different different sides. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they get overflowed. I mean, like after expos and stuff, I I know that oh, a lot of people when they come by geckos and stuff from me, I wonder where they're going. They don't ask about care or genetics or. Yeah. And it's always it's always concerning. I I give them a business card and you know try to pass out care sheets, but still a couple months later I'll get a, a message or an email saying hey. This gecko looks awful, and they show me a picture, and I just I, w- I want to jump through the computer screen and wring their neck. But why wait so long? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know waiting until it's dead to tell you, or until it's total so skinny that it looks like it doesn't even have a drop of water in it. Y- yeah, that's all emaciated, and or they have MBD and. You ask them yeah. what kind of calcium, you know, what kind of supplements are they using, and they go, what's that? And it's, oh, my God, <laughs> what have yeah. I done, you know? So, yeah, I can, well, I can it, it almost makes you not want to sell at shows, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, you never I mean, know where they're going. Yeah, but I've, I've had that with other breeders, too, you know. They ask me, what, what's that powder you're putting on the worms in the dish? Well, it's a supplement. Well, what's that? You know, and breeders, I've had to, breeders say yep. that, at least two. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, it's, it's very yeah. important. Because, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, like if you're just feeding mealworms, that's that's great, but that's it doesn't provide all the, the supplements, the extra stuff they need. Yeah. And I yeah. know I've run out of calcium like in some of my bins or something and I go around and do the calcium thing and you just you see them you know they they flock to it well not flock because you only got <laughs> one in there but you, you know it it just runs to the calcium powder and it knows what it is I mean, females yeah. around breeding season I, I go through god I think I went through five or six pounds of um, reptical this year during breeding season I have you wow. know uh, I don't know, a couple hundred, a couple hundred geckos that I'm doing, maybe three hundred. Right. <laughs> but are, I, are you I, are you going to be breeding all of those? Oh no, I'm. You know, I I let a lot of them go. No, I don't let them go out um. in the wild, but yeah, I, I sell <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> no, I don't. No, and then like next year, I'm going to downsize. I really mean it this time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I say that every every year about right now because I'm so beat up from taking care of all the babies, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so hard, but you know we had a, I I I was cutting back, cutting back, and then buying huge giant projects, and we had a faulty therm, thermostat this earlier this year, like March April time, so uh-huh. I actually did get to cut back, you know, unfortunately, but. It was kind of like one of those blessings in disguise because I didn't want to breed anything. It just whatever eggs were there is what I incubated. I stopped breeding, and it's it's so much nicer to be able to look at your few geckos than have like a million that you're just flying through the rack trying to clean them and you don't get to actually appreciate them. I feel that. <laughs> no, yeah. I did. Yeah, early on I had a. a... A temp- temperature probe go go bad. I don't know. It must have been in March, and I lost probably thirty thirty five eggs because the the yeah. the uh, herbstat was reading, you know, eighty two degrees because the probe went bad. And then I looked at the other um, uh, thermometer that I had in the incubator because I always have you know two or three laying around. <laughs> just monitoring different spots in the incubator, but I, I looked at the other ones and it was like 102 degrees and it's like, oh no. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I think I had four or five out of those and it was the ones that were um, and they came out with no problems. Um, it was the ones wow. that, 
the ones that hatched that they were like in the middle of the newer eggs died off real quick and then the older eggs died off but the ones that were in the middle of the the you know incubation process made it i think five of them made it yeah and i'm i'm holding those five back cuz i i just want to see what they do they seem to be healthy they're female <laughs> maybe maybe Which, you'll uh, force a new mutation yeah i don't yeah i don't i don't know if anything's possible they just look like you know what what they were the parents were the genetics <laughs> it didn't didn't yeah. spin anything out of control um and it was only like i think i checked it at, at 11 at night and then i get up at 4:30 and i go to the gecko room first and um i went in there and i noticed the uh you know the odd temperature in in the thermometers and uh you know freaked out <laughs> and, yeah yeah and then i oh i let it cool down while i was getting ready for work and everything and then i busted open it i had a heat pack going you know cuz i i just unplugged everything and then I, yeah. I got a heat pack going. I think it was a 40-hour heat pack. Got that going. Uh, wrapped it in a T-shirt and and popped it in there. Went to work and came home, and it was it was reading right around 83, 84 degrees. But I mean, the next huh. it was the next day uh, there was eggs just denting. I I think it was the newer ones that were laid went first. Yeah. And then um, I don't know. By the following day, all the it was all. It was nasty. <laughs> it oh yeah, I good, bet. It wasn't a good thing at all. But I, I got that all straightened out, and then I switched. It was the hoverbaiter. I took the, um, you know, that bar that swings around and heats up the heating bar element. I took that yeah, out yeah. and um, and converted it to flex watt. And oh, I nice. had that. Yeah, and I put the the, the eggs in another incubator that I have because I got. I don't know. I got three incubators laying around. I think I normally just use two, <laughs> but um, yeah. And I converted it flex watt, and that it's holding a lot better. Um, That's it, cool. It, yeah. So yeah, it's neat stuff. <laughs> so you coming yeah, down to the Chico show? Uh, I I don't know. Yeah, get down. <laughs> I, no, I, I know watched it drive. really bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're we're looking to buy one of those Jeep Wranglers, the unlimited, you know, four door, and they just released. They're starting to trickle out the 2017. So we might be headed over Redding, Reno, or down uh, Santa Rosa. So we might be in the Chico area. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's right there. Well, off the ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's a little ways from well. the five, but you can you can take that route too. <laughs> yeah. Well Chico's within six hours of me, so <laughs> Yeah, it's only six it's, hours, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's a tiny detour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, you're you're over there kinda of isolated. I I'd, I'd love to yeah. go out there. I, I love Eureka. I think it's a neat area. You know the, the yeah. giant redwoods and uh, Fern Canyon, all that. All that area. It's got all a ton of stuff to go see. But yeah. it's just yeah. So, there's a lot of. It's nice. But then you got that. What is it? The two ninety nine and all the delays. You got to sit there in traffic while they're playing with the road. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They've been been playing with it since. 2014 when we did Chico left. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think even before that, a couple of years before that, I went to Eureka, and um, yeah. I remember s- sitting there waiting, I then, you know, shutting the car off and going out and walking around and, you know, looking at the Trinity River and stuff. <laughs> and nice area, but you know, I had places to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's like that everywhere out of Eureka right now. You can you can't go north, south, or east without having issues. And of course, if you go west, you're just going to drive into the ocean. Yeah, there's oh. yeah, that's that's the west. You can't you can't go very far that way. 
<laughs> she got one of no, the carbo yeah. things. <laughs> oh yeah. She, I don't know that the ocean might come to us. They've been having a, a earthquake warning down in I don't know so, Southern California. Wow. That's... Cluster earthquakes in the I don't know where it was. Uh, down, down in the valley down there. Yeah. Well, as long as they stay down there and they don't come up here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. <laughs> Tsunami it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You go to the Chico show on a surfboard. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be the way to go. Yeah. Hey, I seen one of them lemon frost at uh, uh, the, the Sacramento show. Oh, yeah, Steve. Steve brought some. Yeah, yeah, and I went and looked at it, I don't know, the first day, and it was in shed. It was about to shed, and then. I was going to get back over there on Sunday, and I didn't. And then he he brought it over to the table where we're at and showed it to us. I took a picture of it, and stuff. Kind of oh, nice. kind of neat look, kind of neat looking, bright bright yellow. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's kind of, lemon frost. Out of my price range. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what what was that? Ten thousand for a pair. Yeah, that he got at the auction, and that all went to uh, U.S. Arc or something like that. But I think he's selling yeah. females only. Uh, Twenty five hundred was the buzz, and I know oh, that's nice. your favorite morph. But <laughs> now it's, yeah. it's always interesting to follow these things. You know, you know? I always yeah. like to see see what's going on with the different things. So you, you're you're into. Um, you got the whole frog thing going on now, huh? Yeah, yeah, we're doing doing a lot of frogs, mostly uh, white tree frogs and the red-eyed tree frogs. But we, I do have a lot of Pac-Man frogs. Yeah, I was looking at Mike's Mike uh, Matson's booth at the Sack Show. I seen that uh, yeah. uh, six-legged frog thingy. Oh, really? Yeah, it was kind of cool looking. It's like one of the front legs is. It looked like he swallowed another frog right out of his uh, armpit or something. <laughs> it oh, was wow. cool. It was really cool looking. I meant to get a picture of that, and I didn't. I'm, I'm not Aww. the best at getting pictures. <laughs> 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 I really, really lag. Yeah. Yeah, we, we spent a lot on a Pac-Man frog breeding setup because I, uh, I, I invested in the albino translucent cross to the diamond spawn uh-huh. that there was. And then, of course, the albino translucent male ended up dying. So there's not a lot of people with those now. Oh. You like uh, that translucent stuff, huh? Well, it's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> how, how you, i seen you got um, tomato frogs. How are those working for you? Those are neat looking. I... Okay. I, I, I just got to say, if you buy a frog, I mean, forget every single frog out there. If you can get a tomato frog, I have never been yelled at by a frog. Like, not even a warning, but, you know, like a, a, a scruffling, like, noise and stuff and just looking at you like you're a piece of garbage and then turns mm-hmm. her back on me. Like, Oh, yeah? That is, yeah. They're so they're, they're vocal, huh? Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, not even like vocal, but like it's almost like grumpy cat in a frog. <laughs> cool. I want one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I like the ones that talk to you, <laughs> like crazy yeah. blizzards and whatnot. Yeah. I've, I've got it. No, I remember seeing those God years ago and thinking, God, I want one of them. Same with the white tree frogs. I always like those. Yeah. They're just, yeah, the, the whites know, are pretty cool. You know, like they got a lot of personality, just uh, you know, looking at their face and everything. Yeah, yeah, and you can hand feed them, and they'll come to you, and they look at you, and you know, that's what I really like is like a frog that actually cares about me. You know, I mean, it sounds, it sounds, it would, they send me birthday cards. Sounds, yeah, 
You, you can't even say that it sounds stupid. I mean, unless you're like a non-animal person listening to this. 